glad to be here, glad to have you listening and watching on SPNN, on MTN-TV, and on KMOJ. Uh, FM. I want to thank the collaborating organizations that bring this special town hall meeting to you. Uh, this is a huge collaboration uh, in service to our community by stellar legacy institutions. Uh, first of all, the mighty KMOJ uh, FM 89.9, uh, Pete Rhodes's BMA Network Cable Television, uh, and Insight News. And we're joined today by a partnership with St. Paul Neighborhood Network and MTN. And so the idea is that we are marshalling uh, print, electronic in terms of radio and television and internet to create a set of connections that allow you and us to have a robust conversation about an important issue for our community. And the issue is Minnesota's $1.9, $1.8 billion budget surplus. The question is, what's in it for our community? Where are our interests, how are they defined? We're pleased to have a stellar panel and people in community joining this conversation. Over the course of the next two hours, we'll talk about the policy issues, the preferences, the needs of people of color, and how we make sure that our voices and our interests are at the table. We want results that reflect our contribution and our participation in the great state of Minnesota. Uh, I want to uh, welcome, first of all, the uh, for sort of budget 101, a primer on the budget, uh, the commissioner of the Department of Management and Budget for the State of Minnesota, Commissioner Myron Franz. Commissioner, good morning and welcome. Good morning, thank you, Al, for having me. Pull the microphone close to you there. All right. And I want to begin by giving our <coughs> viewers and listeners an idea of what's on the table right now. Uh, we've been hearing $1.8 billion, $1.89 billion. In past years, I believe, we always talked about budget shortfalls and tightening the budget and budget cuts, programs being cut. But it seems like right now we have a unique window of opportunity. We've got a lot of money projected in the budget. And the question is, should we give that money back to the taxpayers directly or find ways to invest that money so that we can grow the economy, grow jobs, uh, try to address some of the pernicious and persistent problems of disparities that plague uh, our great state. And so, before we get into the details of that, I'd like for you to give our viewers and listeners sort of a primer. What does it mean to have a $1.8, $1.9 billion surplus? Where does the money come from, first of all, and where will it go? How does the state spend money? The Commissioner Myron France. Well, that's a great introduction because the history is important. It wasn't that long ago. For like 11 years, 9 out of 11 years, we had budget deficits, and only recently have we had this new surplus. And the reason we're having the surplus is because Minnesota is doing very well. Minnesota is doing above average. We are a success story. There, as you mentioned, there are some still issues we need to deal with as a state and as, as a region, but we are, we are on the move. Minnesota has a fifth lowest unemployment of all the states in the country. The Twin Cities has the lowest unemployment rate of, e of any major metropolitan area in this country. So what this means is the economy is growing. There are more jobs are being created. We, we are seeing finally now we're seeing wage growth occur. We're seeing income, income growth occur. And we're also seeing the economy, uh, economic activity growing. So we're seeing in, increased income taxes. We're seeing increased sales taxes. And those are the things, the kinds of revenue that are adding to the surplus. But we've also managed our expenditures very carefully the last few years. Uh, many of the panelists here will know and remember that we had borrowed money from schools to plug some of the holes in the budget deficits before. We've paid that $2.8 billion back. And now we're, we're looking at what happens to a state like Minnesota when the economy is growing. So what happens every November and every uh, February, we have a November forecast. And that is where the surplus comes from. So the, our economists take a look at the revenues that are, that are coming in. They look at the expenditures expenditures, and then they try to do the real magic, and that is project what's going to happen the next two years. That's the difficult part. No one knows for sure, obviously, but we do know that wages are growing, income is growing, as I said, and expenditure, expenditures are under control. So what's happened in our February forecast, we saw an increase of over $800 million go to our surplus, and now we have almost $1.9 billion in a budget balance for the next biennium, and we have over $3.1 billion 
dollar budget surplus for the biennium after that. It has been a long time since we have looked at two biennium in a row with this kind of a surplus. So that's how the, the surplus comes about because we measure the, the activity, we compare it to our expenditures, and we project what's going to happen in the future. So that's how we got the 1.9, almost $1.9 billion balance. But where does the money come from? How does the state acquire that money? Uh, that What's the state's budget, first of all, and how does the state earn money, get money? The state's annual budget is a little over $20 billion per year, or a little over $40 billion for every two years. And so the money comes in through people uh, purchasing uh, sales taxes, it generates a lot of revenue. Property taxes ma mainly goes to the local, but there's also some state revenues. So there's property tax, there's sales taxes, there's the cigarette tax that we increase to reduce smoking, and of course there's the income tax. And the income tax has been the one that has shown the most increase because we were able to, you may remember several years ago, we added a fourth income tax tier and asked those at the top to pay 2% to pay 2% more. Well, that is also contributing to our revenue stream. But the, the state gets money because people pay taxes and fees, and that money comes in to the state, and then we hold that money and pay our expenditures. And now we see $1.9 billion on the plus side in excess of our, expend, our projected expenditures. Let's talk about, broadly speaking, what the state spends money on. Where does the budget go? Well, primarily the budget goes to education. Mm -hmm. It goes to transportation to health and human services. Those in higher education, if you, if you look at those four categories, that's over 70% of our budget goes to those, those categories. And so every year we look at the, uh, the, uh, the money that goes to education through K, K through 12 and higher education. In fact, that's one of the, you may recall, two years ago we added all day kindergarten to our budget and that uh, added some more money. This year the governor's proposing universal pre-K for four year olds. Mm -hmm which is over $230 million to add to the budget. So it's education, it's um, uh, both pre-K through 12 and higher education, it's Department of Human Services, and it's uh, transportation. Those are the big areas that we spend money year after year. Okay. And so we're looking at uh, the biennium and the likelihood of almost $2 billion in surplus. What uh, kind of considerations must the administration make? And where does the legislature come into this picture? Uh, because something's going to be done with the money. And as I said to begin with, uh, there's some philosophies here at play. In general, uh, the perception is that conservative philosophy is that budget surpluses ought to be returned to the taxpayer. And that might mean uh, any number of modalities for tax cuts or tax returns. Uh, others, however, progressive, I would say, uh, would want uh, the government to invest in problem solving. And one of the issues for the African American community and communities of color, I believe, is how do we uh, count on our state to invest and, in enabling, resourcing properly, initiatives from within the community to solve problems that are persistent. You mentioned the budget goes to education, goes to human services and transportation. So the question I want to raise is how a big a part of those budgets uh, impact the organizations and residents of our state uh, in a way that we see positive change in, uh, in our communities. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's a, it's a great question. One of the things that happens with the February forecast, that really sets the stage for the legislature and the governor to, to negotiate what is the correct budget for Minnesota. So what happens, the governor submits a budget. He submitted a budget in January based on the November forecast, and next week he's going to submit the new budget based on this new $1.9 billion uh, surplus. He will submit that to the legislature, and that then begins a process where the legislature and the governor sit down and try to come up with a budget by the end of the session, which is May 18th. So in that, in that negotiating process, the governor is going to make a pitch, and the legislature will have their responses, but the governor is going to make a pitch that we need to invest this money and not necessarily, we need to give it back in ways that are more long-term rather than short-term. And what happened in 1999 and 2000, for those of you who are around, some of you are not that old, but we gave back, we had some surpluses, we gave back big refunds, and we reduced tax rates. Well. Then in the decade of 2000, we had uh, deficit after deficit after deficit. We didn't take that money and invest it in opportunity. We just gave it back to $150 or $200. And I'm not dismissing that as an important amount for individuals to get. 
But the governor's point of view is we need to take a look at how did we get to where we have $1.9 billion. We got to this point because Minnesota is, there are more jobs, there are more people getting opportunities, there's more educational opportunities, and he believes that we're in this for the long haul. And he believes in investing this money going forward. So he's going to make recommendations next week where he will propose investing in uh, u funding universal pre-K, for example, and, and a tuition freeze for the universities and, and various things like that. He's, he wants to sort of give it back, if you will, in a way that is, is, uh, is, an, is an investment for the future and not just an individual check for, in, for individuals. So, but that dynamic is going to get set up with the Senate and the House as we all try to come together and figure out, well, where, how does this money get into the Department of Human Service, Services? What are the best programs for the, uh, the Minnesota Families programs, for example? The governor is, gonna, is looking at ways to increase the amount of cash grants. He's looking at housing uh, for uh, working, working families. He's making a pitch for uh, the child credit for young families, middle income families, because child care is so expensive these days. And for working families, it's really tough. So to kind of set the stage a little bit, I think the governor is really going to make the pitch to invest this money in programs and opportunities so that we can continue the growth in Minnesota. His vision is one of Minnesota where everyone has an opportunity. We reduce barriers and we, we provide opportunities for education and jobs in a holistic way, not sort of individual through tax refunds. So is there opposition to that idea? Yes, and you mentioned actually how the, uh, the conservative idea would be more to, to sort of give it back in the way of tax, different kind of tax cuts. Well, actually, I would disagree with that. I think the conservative approach ought to be supporting families uh. because if you really want to support families and long-term budget growth, you look at how can we position ourselves so that uh, more and more kids graduate. More and more kids are successful in high school. They go on to training or they go on to college and they provide, they get better opportunities to make more money, to have more satisfying families. We reduce the barriers. I mean, uh, mental health is a big issue in the Department of Human Services where Commissioner Jessen has done such a great job in that agency and one of the things she's really been advocating is for we need more uh, community mental health issues, more uh, chemical dependency. So what we need to do is attack those barriers where people are not succeeding and figure out ways that we can provide programs and opportunities to reduce the barriers so those folks can have a more successful job and more successful family. I'm Al McFarland. This is a special town hall meeting. The subject today is the Minnesota uh, $1.9 billion projected tax or budget surplus. And our theme today kinda is uh, budgets matter. Uh, budgets matter to our people, to black people, and we are assembled today to engage in a conversation here on SPNN TV in St. Paul, on MTN TV in Minneapolis, and live on KMLJ radio uh, in Twin Cities. Raising the question of the interest of black people, before we continue, I want to sort of acknowledge some of the background in bringing this particular program together. We've had a group meeting on Tuesdays for, oh, uh, almost a half a year now, a small leadership group uh, considering issues of education, of business, of political empowerment for the black community. And out of that group, we've done some important things. One is we've created a series of town hall meetings looking at education in Minneapolis. How do we create uh, equity? How do we create resources for teachers? How do we address getting parents and families involved, community involved in delivering a quality experience that turns around the decimal failure of some of the public schools that serve our children? Out of that uh, meeting, we also have discussed things like the budget. We've discussed the role of two of our, three of our leading lights in the legislature, uh, the role of Senator Jeff Hayden, the role of Senator Bobby Champion, and the work of Representative Rena Moran. We've also worked to support the um, great uh, Dr. Michael T. Fagan, uh, 39th annual African American Student Leadership Award, which just occurred as part of Black History Month. Out of our meetings, uh, we've decided that today we should talk about the budget. We know that the uh, budget decisions for this state will be made final in the next month or two, and it's timely for us to question and put our voices, our interests on the table in a public way. I want to thank uh, 
some of the following people who've been at the table every week. Uh, they include uh, Al Flowers, uh, a tireless organizer and champion of uh, doing right by our community in our community. Uh, Peter Hayden, uh, who is the creator of the Turning Point organization, a uh, visionary leader addressing the mental health needs of our community. Lisa Delgado, an educator. Uh, uh, Louis King, the uh, president of Summit Academy OIC, and uh, two members of the school board, regular participants, leaders in this project, Kim Ellison and Rebecca Gagnon. I want to thank uh, Scott Gray, uh, who heads the Minneapolis Urban League, and of course, Dr. Michael T. Fagan for what he's done. Also at the table have been Elisa Clemens uh, and Ravi Norman from Thor Construction. Many people uh, bringing this moment, this conversation to your attention. Uh, but great thanks to the partners. Uh, this media event is important, it's new, hasn't happened before. A collaboration between KMLJ, we thank Kelvin Quarles, the manager of KMLJ, uh, between BMA Network Cable Television, Pete Rose, uh, a visionary leader in the communications industry, uh, my organization, Insight News, and we thank our partnership uh, in the person of Steve Brunsberg, who's managing this live broadcast on SPNN and uh, Channel 19 in St. Paul and MTN Channel 16 in Minneapolis. So we're doing the right thing. Our mission is to uh, create a public conversation. Our goal is to create a public knowledge, public debate. Our people need to own the question of the budget, own the solutions we bring and demand and, uh, and deliver uh, our voice, our priorities, and that's why we're here today. So thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I want to turn now, and we'll come back to uh, Commissioner uh, Myron France as the program continues. I want to bring in uh, one of the uh, leaders in the Senate, uh, the senior member of our dynamic duo, Senator Jeff Hayden. Senator Hayden, good morning. How are you doing? Good morning, Al. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, thank you, first of all, and thanks to your colleague, Senator Champion, for your leadership and your service. You are the deputy leader. Uh, of the Senate. Yep, Deputy Majority Leader. And uh, that's an important role, and you're active in a variety of committees. You can tell the things that you're working on. But I wanted you to put in context why this conversation about the budget is important for our people, for all Minnesotans. But, you know, too often uh, our people think that's somebody else's business. Mm -hmm. And we're here today to say, no, this is our business, and we got to be present and accounted for. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, Al, thank you, and thank you to all the sponsors of this great event. Um, I think this is the type of venue and the type of forum that hopefully uh, our viewers are watching and more people are kind of taking a look at it. I think Commissioner Franz has really kind of laid out kind of what is going on in the budget and the, the, the dollar amounts. I think, you know, you think of $40 billion, uh, that's a lot of money of Minnesota taxpayer money that goes into running the state. And I think the idea and the opportunity for us to invest in our future uh, is with the governor's leadership is really spot on. But we have to start to pay attention. We have to start to understand, you know, there's been a lot of talk about equity and equal distribution and how does that work. So I think that the budget and the conversation every two years that I have with my friends in the legislature that talks about the budget and what should our investments be. And not just kind of broadly, we do spend a lot of money on a lot of programs, schools and healthcare. I serve on all the healthcare committees. There is a tremendous amount of money that gets spent on healthcare and human service. Um, and the delivery of that. But there also is an issue of, is that money being used in a way that's effective for all Minnesotans? Um, and so the overall number says that, yes, this is a great state. It's doing really well. It's a, I, I like to call it, it's a really, really good state. Mm -hmm. But there is a way that they need to be great. And for this, for this state to be great, we have to deal with this issue of inequity. Uh, this issue of the gaps, right? We all kind of call it different things, this issue of disparity. And so in Minnesota, um, if you are African-American, in particular moderate or low income, you aren't doing that well. We aren't leading the nation in education if you're that person. We're not leading the nation in the unemployment if you're that person. In fact, you're at the bottom. You're at the bottom. Of the nation. You're at the bottom yeah. of the nation. And so this is a state that is uh, too, as, as, as commissioners talked about, is doing the right thing, but we need to do the right thing with all Minnesotans. And so part of this conversation and debate and what we deliberate each and every day at the legislature is to figure out how to continue to make the state go forward, but at the same time not leave people behind. 
So there are people who are left at the station, if you will. Mm -hmm. The train is going down the road, but there's people that somehow can't get on that train. And that really is a conversation that we're having. And I, I know that the despair conversation, we're kind of uh, f disparity fatigued. You know, we talk about it so much, but it's really now time for us to do something. And so really taking a look, holding not only us that you see that are African-American legislators, by the way, this is the African-American caucus, um, which uh, suggests that we have a disparity in the legislature in of itself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But not only just to hold us, but to hold each and every legislator and, and also the governor accountable for these issues. So no matter where you live, we should be able to talk to those legislators and really articulate to them what are the things that they want, bring your great ideas, not just your complaints, but your ideas and your solutions. We are more than happy to take, to take those calls, to do um, uh, uh, forums like this. But if we're going to really kind of move the agenda, then it's going to have to be kind of all in. It's going to have to be all hands on deck, not just simply the legislators of color, which are doing their fair share and more. I would, I would suggest if I take a look at my friend's portfolio of bills that they're doing, they're doing more uh, than probably um, a, reg a regular kind of rank and file legislator. But that's because the community has to demand more. They have to demand more of their legislators. Um, I think we can do it, and as we continue to have this conversation and as we push, we are starting to figure out that there are solutions, there are resources that can be dedicated, that can be targeted, that can move the needle, but we must, must uh, get involved. Um, it is those who show up uh, at the legislature, those who call, those who email, those that show up at forums like this, that is who listens. Mm -hmm. and that is who we listen to. We can't, we don't know what you want if you don't show up. So uh, this idea of um, Monday morning quarterbacking, I call it, right, that people complain and they sit back and the legislative session is over and they get upset because they didn't get what they want. Oddly, nine times, nine times out of ten, that person has never called, written, or showed up to one of these forums. So I actually make this a push to the community as a whole to really get active and involved on these issues. Um, the process, though, um, is a little complicated, but we can learn. And if I can learn it as Senator Champion, Representative Moran can learn it, we can learn this process. If everyone else in Minnesota can make that call and can come over for their days on the Hill, then we really need to be able to do that. Let's make a pitch then to our listeners and viewers right now. If you're watching or listening on KMLJ, uh, take out your phone, your PDA, and uh, uh, do some tweeting, do some Facebooking, uh, however you do social media. Let your digital world know that the Minnesota budget surplus matters. Let them know that black lives matter and that we are meeting here right now on television and on radio having a conversation about the interest of our people. So uh, I'll remind you again and again through this program, uh, take out your PDA and send a message. Tweet somebody, uh, Facebook, uh, do a messenger, but let the world know that we're having this conversation right now. Before I go to Senator Champion, I want to bring in our uh, member from the House of Representatives, uh, Representative Rena Moran. Uh, Representative, good morning and thank you for being here. Let's Pull be your here. microphone to you, okay. maybe. Uh, I think you're okay. Just there we go. Great. And let's talk about the House side of this equation. Uh, you're looking at uh, the opportunity for the state to decide how to dispose of or to reconcile this budget uh, surplus, almost two billion dollars. What do your constituents need? How would you like to see our state uh, use those resources to help the people that you represent? people that you serve. Yeah. Well, thank you, Al. I am really uh, excited to be here this morning and to really uplift the uh, $1.9 billion surplus, surplus that we have here. And, you know, listening to the commissioner here, I am now a little bit more informed, too, you know. And that's what it's all about. It's about being connected to what's going on so that we become a more informed community of people who know the process and what the process looks like. And... Um, I would also like to say that, um, you know, I am uh, a strong supporter of the governor. I think he has made some great investment, you know, from education to pre-K to all day kindergarten, from freezing college tuition for two years. Um, just some great investment that goes beyond the educational uh, entity to just, you know, creating a holistic approach to better outcomes and raising uh, the income level for the top 2%. Um, you know, as we pay our fair share, it's really important that they were paying their fair share, too. 
Uh, and, and that is great. You know, our commissioner here who is, um, who uh, was able to just really explain the budget in a really thorough, clear w way was uh, right on point. And I have to agree with my senator over there around uh, the insight as we talk about Minnesota is doing so well, is doing great. And many can say we're doing really, really great. But as we know, in the black community, we, are, we have some of the worst disparities within every system. And, you know, that is not okay. And we have to do better. We have to work to ensure that we are lifting up everyone. You know, everyone needs to be on that train. And I know within my community, it is really, really important. The one thing I talked about so often, you know, and I go back, I'm now serving my third term in the House uh, as the only African American in the community. And I must also agree with my senator to say that, you know, we are a people who are doing great work in our community. Often we're doing work, that work, on little budget or no budget, working very hard to create better outcomes for the families in our community. We do that, so I know we have solutions, right? But to move those solutions from the community to the capital, to the policies, to being a part of this $1.9 billion, billion dollar surplus, we need to have your presence and your voice at the capital to be a part of this process. Not just knocking on the doors of the Black Caucus here, because I'm the only African American in the House and representative. So what I need is a partnership. I need us to be in, in, in partnership with each other about what is best needed for the African American community, and you bringing your solutions to me and helping me keep my other legislators accountable for what we need. That is the process. That is what's needed. You know, in, in my community, you know, we talk about jobs. I know that there are from young people, from the teens to older uh, individuals who want to be working, who want to take care of themselves. So we have to bring those jobs, whether it's job training, whether it's apprenticeship, whether it's an internship, some of that needs to be paid, right? But we need that in our community. We need to get our young people off the streets, right? We need to create opportunities for our young people to get the experience that they need so that they can enter the workforce ready and prepared. So making those connections is absolutely important. And we need some investment. We need some intentional investment. We can't assume because we create these trainings that it's going to reach the populations that it should reach, which I would say would be the African American community because we are less in jobs. Education, um, gosh, you know, Many would say that education is the way out of poverty. I think we can't agree to that, right? And so our kids are struggling. We have to make, we're gonna invest in pre-K, you know, a part, and, and I know um, child care is unaffordable, but at the end of the day, all the research tell us that if our kids are involved in an early learning program, they are more apt to be ready for kindergarten, and, and these days they need to also be reading by kindergarten, right? But since third grade is the predictor of your success, they need to be reading by third grade. So we need to look at those CCAPS families. We need to invest in that basin, um, the basin sliding fee scale for all those parents who's on the waiting list. We need to work to, in to ensure that, yes, we invested in four-year-olds, in four but all the data tell us that zero to three is important. We need to go back. If we're going to create better outcomes and opportunities and a great investment long term, we got to invest early in all our babies. So uh, my hope is that we can use some of that surplus to make sure that we are closing these gaps in the early childhood field, that we are investing in that, that we are investing strongly in job creation um, holistically. And we also know that if families are homeless, it's really hard for them to you know, get the kids to school on time, for kids to achieve and, and, and do well in school. Stabilizing families is really, really critical, that we invest in housing, we invest in some of these assistant um, rental property, because most people in the black community, they're, they're renting. But we, as we know, rent is really unaffordable. So we have to take the time to help subsidize the, the whole housing, the whole rental assistance, and create better outcomes and use the $1.9 billion to do that. Thank you, Representative Moran. I'm Al McFarland. This is a special broadcast of the Insight KMOJ BMA Network Cable 
town hall forum on the $1.9 billion surplus, budget surplus for the state of Minnesota. Our theme is what are the interests of the black community? We're gonna continue with this discussion in just a moment. First, we'll take a break for station ID. McFarland, welcome back to the special town hall meeting on the $1.9 billion Minnesota budget surplus. We are grateful to have this great collaboration, uh, first of its kind, the first time ever, a simulcast on uh, the mighty, mighty KMLJ, the heart and soul of Twin Cities, and two television partners, SPNN, here in St. Paul, where we are producing this show live, and uh, our partner, sister cable station in St. Paul, in Minneapolis, MTN. So thank you for viewing, thank you for watching, and thank you for listening on KMOJ. What's most important is that we need to use every means necessary to get our people involved, to engage our ideas, and to make sure we project and protect our interests. I'm pleased to have the members of the Black Caucus of Minnesota's legislature here today to lead that discussion and to analyze and talk about and to reason with each other and with you uh, about the question of how we handle uh, and solve the needs of our community. I want to go to uh, my legislator, the great Senator Bobby Champion. Uh, Bobby Champion, thank you for being here. Thank you for your service to our community. Uh, Bobby Champion heads uh, my district uh, in North Minneapolis, District 59. Uh, and he's the vice chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, Bobby, weigh in if you would. I mean, are we on the right track as a community in this event talking about the budget and what it means to our community? First of all, let me st start by saying thank you to you, Al, and to all your strategic partners and key stakeholders that came together in order to uh, reach the conclusion that this sort of engagement or conversation is important. So I want us to pause because sometimes people say that people in the black community can't work with each other, and this proves that you can. not And so I am excited about that. Um, what I will say is that I am proud to represent Senate uh, District 59. And usually, uh, most people just think I represent North Minneapolis, and I'm proud to represent North Minneapolis, but I also represent uh, the North Loop, which is the warehouse district in downtown Minneapolis. Also, half of downtown, which includes the Viking Stadium and the Twin Stadium and the Guthrie and the Target Center and all those other great places or spaces in downtown Minneapolis, and then also a portion of Bryn Mawr. And so I'm proud to be the senator who represents those areas. And in the legislature, I am vice chair of finance, but I'm also on transportation. Uh, I, I'm also on the Commerce Committee Judiciary because I'm a lawyer as well, uh, and capital investments with my good friend, Senator Hayden. With that being said, I want to encourage our community to take a slightly different view of this uh, budget issue. We, we've been posing and framing the question around the $1.9 billion surplus, which I think is great because that's a reflection of great work that the legislature and the governor has done in order to, to put us in a strategic place right now for us to enjoy a, uh, uh, a, a, a surplus as opposed to a deficit, because we have been in the legislature when we've been cutting <laughs> and not looking at how we're moving forward. Here is what I believe to be important. We are talking about the $1.9 billion surplus, but do you not know that we as a state, we spend roughly $65 billion over biennium, right? And the legislature 
Uh, in our last budget notion, we control $39.4 billion. Now, the reason why I'm putting that in context is because we're talking about $1.9 billion, and there's much more money to be talking about. And so what that seems to suggest to me is that we've been making great investments, but we need to make some strategic targeted investments in order to make sure that the money that we are spending benefits us. We shouldn't just be talking about $1.9 billion. There's, uh, uh, there's some other money that's being left on the table. And so from my vantage point, um, we need to talk about that. Yes, we've made great investments, but we should be making targeted investments in order to lift our people out of the disparities that we find ourselves in. And what is the best analogy that I can give? Think about it just from a healthcare perspective. My good friend here, you know, represents us on all the health uh, care committees. But if you have an issue, uh, a medical issue, and you go to the doctor, sometimes people go to a general practitioner. And the general practitioner who is smart and intelligent and has all the credentials that it takes in order to listen to you. But guess what? If that general practitioner cannot meet your need and your need is specialized, they send you to a specialty uh, doctor or surgeon sometimes, or someone who specializes in that area. Why? Because it takes a little more than what we put forward. And I believe that we have to go to a surgeon, and we are the surgeon. And guess what? Not a doctor on this earth can tell you what's wrong with you without you giving the doctor information. That's right. When you come through the door, the doctor, once they come in, says, what are you feeling, <laughs> right? What are your symptoms? What are the challenges? And from that, they use the expertise by which to diagnose and then come up with a prognosis as to what you need in order to move you forward. So I think that we have to be very surgical. I think we have to look at what are the challenges? Where are we spending the money? And not just that we're spending the money, but is it having any real impact on what we need to see as outcomes? And when we think in terms of our budget, our budget should reflect our priorities and our values. What do we value? What, what are the priorities? If we understand that there's a tale of two cities, why? Right? And so I think that the community can demand change, mm -hmm. but we can't come at it from a deficit-based perspective, but it has to be solution-based, right? But not only should we raise our voice, but that has to be coupled with community participation. Because what happens so often is that our community will say, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem, and want us to solve the problem. And then when we look around the room for the communities to be standing there with us, then we're the only ones standing in the room. And then they come back and say, hey, whatever happened to that problem? <laughs> Right? And so I think that from a different perspective, and we're being generalized, and we can talk about some specifics later in the program whenever you would like for us to, Mr. Moderator, but I think we have to come from the perspective that there is a lot of money on the table, more than just $1.9 billion, but what are we doing in order to use our investments in order to help us move from point A to point B? Mm -hmm. And how are we going to partner with the state as a community in order to make that happen? Well, Senator Champion, let me uh, be the, uh, the advocate of the adversary here and challenge you on that. Um, uh, and the question is, uh, is there a reason? Explain the reticence uh, for engagement and involvement by our community. And it's not that our community doesn't want to be involved. I believe the history is that our effort to be, be involved has been consistently rebuked, rejected, pushed to the margin, right? And so after so long, you get the message, you're not welcome, your voice is not important, you have no power, uh, your ideas don't matter. And I say that to describe kind of the uh, nature and the reason for what appears to be apathy in our community. Uh, respond to that. I think that, uh, uh, thank you for that question because I think that is an important dynamic that we need to talk about in real time, that you're absolutely right. There are those who, will, who are not willing to give up power, right? That is the nature of the environment that we find ourselves in. And you're absolutely right that sometimes that message can be given and, and, and uh, we'll take that message and then we'll begin to work from that frame uh, that we're not welcome. But guess what? Our issues are never popular, right? And when you are fighting for those who have less than and who are challenged, that's never a, 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 a popular position. 
And so when we have the discussions with the legislature, there are others that says, oh, my God, you know, here comes Bobby Champion again talking about that. But I am energized when I see people who look like me, who, uh, and they don't always have to even just look like me, but if, if we have a, a, a um, meeting of the minds for them to say, hey, you're on the right track, right? It's because it's never a popular position, it, it, because I believe that the world is run by those who show up, right? And yes, there's apathy. I will give you a good example. Last week in the Senate, we were talking about what? Child protection. Child protection has been a very big issue, and we can articulate and talk about what I think is wrong with what is going on with the governor's task force. And the governor's doing a good job of at least putting the issue before the public. But I think there's been some flaws in the process, right? And the, and the majority of people who are in child protection look like me or you. They're usually, uh, uh, that's right. Point, I mean, yeah. all, the, all the empirical data uh, uh, will uh, tell you that. So, so somewhere along the way, there's some challenges, right? It's, now, that is not to suggest, and I want to make sure that people are clear, that, uh, that um, I believe that uh, everyone who is dealing with child protection uh, uh, should not be dealing with child protection. There's some people who should, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's some challenges along the yes. way. But the bottom line is, when we had the hearing, there was a person who came to sit at the table who looked like me. And before the person could even open her mouth to say one word, the chairperson says, make sure you're just testifying to the bill. She hasn't even said anything. <laughs> and that, but that isn't what he would normally do if someone else sat at the table. I had to say, Mr. Chair, I'm sure we're going to give her an opportunity to speak so that we can hear what she's going to say first. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and, but that's what happened, right? And so that gets to your point, mm -hmm. Al. Yes, they will push. But guess what? We come from a group of people and from a legacy of people that we have not been sidetracked by the fact that other people believe that our position is unpopular. If we didn't like it, we would uh, do everything we've done from when we were taken as slaves, come through the Middle Passes, been on a plantation and fought, and Harriet Tubman and others throughout history have always said, I'm not gonna live like this, right? And so I'm just encouraging us to reject that notion mm -hmm. of apathy and to reject the notion that we should just go along just to get along because someone has to change the dialogue at the table in order for change to be afoot. Senator Hayden. Well, you know, I think Senator Champion absolutely articulated kind of where we need to go kind of with this issue. And even in the child protection issue, you know, we have been dealing with this issue and everybody that I know has talked about auto home placement forever and the disproportionality of kids of color, in particular African-American and American Indian kids that are being taken out of their homes. Um, but when it was time to have the conversation um, I've heard it. I've pushed back. Senator Champion did a phenomenal job in the ju Judiciary Committee. We had a couple, two African Americans that were able to testify, and that was really the only folks that were in the room. Um, and so I will go back to this notion that we know how to go to the movies and when the movie starts. We know how to go out to eat. We know when the next concert is coming, and we're there on time, early, and we're buying our tickets. But somehow, when it is time to have this conversation about our children, um, about the budget and others, we don't have the same amount of enthusiasm. Mm. So I guess what I'm saying is that we are not apathetic on things that look like they're fun. That's what I tell my, my son, right? He, he, is, he is out the door and on time when it's time to go out, but when it's time for him to clean up his room, or to do his homework, then somehow he's got a little apathy in him, right? So we have to be able to really kind of change that. Uh, with all due respect, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator Al, we have to be able to get excited about these issues. We have to be able to say we're going to support them. We have to be able to have the same amount of enthusiasm that we have when it is about something that appears to be fun, mm -hmm. that is enjoyable, about these issues that we face each and every day. We are certainly going to show up, but it is so much easier to have a conversation amongst people who look like you and understand that even the nods that you give me today, that gives us the kind of energy that we have to fight as opposed to continuing to run uphill without your group, without your army there with you. So though, though we have to do this together, so I'm not blaming uh, mm -hmm. the public, but what I am saying is that we have to get engaged. We have to really kind of understand that this, the reason 
that we are in the position that we're in. There are a lot of it, but some of it is that we are not fighting hard enough. We are not pushing hard enough. We are not demanding that our legislators and that our local lawmakers, our county administrators, you, we should demand. In North Minneapolis alone, right, Senator Champions District, there's well over $100 million that goes in for social programs, right? But the outcomes aren't there. So we're not demanding uh, 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 Senator Champion, uh, 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 Representative Dean, uh, and, and others, myself, what is going on and where is that money going and what are the outcomes of that? That's my money that you're spending and I don't know what it's being spent on. We are prepared to answer those questions today, but it has to be more and you have to demand more out of all of your legislators. I often talk to people about the legislators, the representatives in my district, and often they don't know who they are. We got to figure out how to do better. And these types of forms, I think, are really uh, uh, helpful to, for us to really kind of light a fire under our community in the same way that we have when it looks like it's something enjoyable that we want to do. I'm Al McFarland. You're watching and listening to a special Insight KMOJ BMA Networks Cable Television Town Hall Forum on the two point or $1.9 billion Minnesota budget surplus. Uh, we're gathered at the studios of SPNN in St. Paul. The program is being broadcast live on KMLJ, the heart and soul of Twin Cities, and broadcast live on SPNN, Channel 19 in St. Paul, and Channel 16 at MTN in Minneapolis. Uh, before we continue, I want to bring some voices of some expert people in the audience to this conversation. But senators and representative and commissioner, uh, I, I want you all to think about these things and we'll bring community voices to this conversation. Uh, I'm interested in what the legislative priorities you may have in the area of education. You've mentioned this already. In the area of child protection, what should we be thinking about? What is on the table in terms of bills? Uh, or what could be on the table to reflect and project the interests of our community? Uh, what about jobs and training? I want to talk about uh, what kind of resources there are to support job creation and training in our community. What about housing? Housing is critical. Our community was wiped out by the, by the mortgage crisis several years ago. Black wealth decimated by the mortgage crisis and black confidence, I think, weakened, uh, destroyed in part by the uh, challenges that people uh, experience trying to become homeowners. Uh, health consistent issue, an important issue. How should we be demanding uh, support for resources, agencies, organizations in our community that deal with our health that we say are culturally competent, capable, able to represent and reflect our interest? What about the arts? Uh, we've got a great arts and culture to tradition, but as often as not, uh, art becomes an afterthought. Should it be front and center? What about young people? What about the energy of the young? How do we accommodate and nourish, grow the vitality, the engagement of young people in our community? Uh, Senator Champion, uh, Senator Hayden, you've both worked on uh, restoration of voting rights. Let's talk about that. And then there's discussion now in the legislature about uh, new rules and regulations around weapons, uh, conceal and carry, I think, and maybe silencers. Uh, let's talk about that. I'm interested in talking about immigration. We have a powerfully diverse African African American community uh, swelled by the positive presence of our brothers from Somalia, our brothers from Liberia, and from Africa and the Caribbean. But there are issues facing uh, the immigrant, the new African American communities. One issue is uh, the issue of potential recruitment for young people uh, for so-called terrorist activities out of the Somali community in particular. Uh, but you know, I like to have that discussion alongside a discussion about the recruitment of young people for so-called gang activity in our community right here. And so we're looking at sort of um, problems in Ferguson right now. How does that differ from the problems that our people are experiencing anywhere else in the world? So keep all those things in mind. Before we continue, though, I want to uh, bring in a voice uh, to raise a question about business. 
Silas Houston is the president and CEO of MASCA. MASCA is the Metro Area Small Contractors Alliance. And Silas, thank you for being here. Thank you for your work. You want to call attention to the need to create more pathways for small businesses to operate in the business arena. Uh, talk about what you do. What is MASCA and why is this discussion important for small business and your partners in particular? Well, I appreciate you having me here on the show and giving a chance to talk about what we do. Uh, MASCA, as you said, stands for Metro Area Small Contractors Alliance. We've been around for five years. We are a for-profit entity. We really provide two distinct services. We provide outsourced diversity services to developers and general contractors, and then we provide supportive and de developmental day-to-day -day support for diversity contractors. We do that together under what we call a shared resource model. Really what it is is a group of people who really a lot of the issues when we start talking about issues of minority businesses, the same thing as small businesses. That's the reason why our name says small business as opposed to minority business because a lot of those issues are economy of scale, they are related to having access to appropriate support teams and access to consistent capital. So MASC had got its start when the city of St. Paul got hit uh, by HUD with the VCA, Voluntary Compliance Agreement, where five years ago they were told that they had not uh, met the requirements for HUD in terms of Section 3, which is low-income requirements for when they're building stuff, they have, they have construction, they're required to hire from within the community, low-income contractors and employees. Um, they had not complied with that. And so we got a chance to see that, me and a couple of uh, friends of mine, got a chance to see it in its draft form. And it got us to thinking, uh, wow, okay, um, if they have to do this, um, this is gonna create some opportunities, but what does that mean? Um, and we really went and said, okay, are we ready for it? And so we spent a couple of years meeting with contractors. We've met over, the, um, over that period of time with over 100 diversity contractors. We met with a couple of dozen general contractors. We met with every municipality you could imagine to really find out what was going on. Why weren't we doing more, having more? And we learned a lot through that process. And after we learned what the issues were, we found out that the small contractors, diversity contractors, were not the only ones with issues. Pain points is what we call them. Uh, we found that the developers had pain points. We found that the municipalities had pain points. Found that the people that were out there with the money to help them, the economic development agencies, had pain points. And so MASCA really is a model of self-determination of us looking at what was out there and deciding where are the opportunities for us. And it started from we're just not big enough. I mean, we need to have uh, an economy of scale. So, thank you, Silas Houston. Let me turn then to the senators and to Representative Moran. Uh, the question of business, how do we make sure that our businesses get a fair shot at doing business with the state and in the marketplace? Uh, and Senator Champion, you were absolutely uh, powerfully correct in saying that, yes, it's okay to look at the 1.9 billion dollar surplus, but the real money is the $64 billion budget. And our governor has said he intends that his administration really reflect uh, and engage all communities. How do we make that happen for uh, in, the, in the business arena altogether, across all departments, and in a way that it also affects private enterprise? Senator? Uh, uh, a, a couple of things. Number one is that you're right. The the uh, the governor's been doing a great job of really engaging a diverse uh, uh, community. So it's uh, so let me bifurcate it. So so on the inside, number one, the uh, governor has been engaging his department heads, commissioners around uh, diversifying their workforce. So there, there's an internal uh, committee and commission uh, where they are analyzing that data, they're looking at it, and they are uh, uh, finding ways by which to diversify the, the state agencies. So that's one way. 
another way is is like I said, and and the commissioner is, is here, and he can talk a little more about that. But on the outside, they're also looking at uh, uh, contracts that they're letting out. Um, uh, if there's DBE requirements, which is disadvantaged uh, business enterprises, they're looking at how do they meet those goals, how do they increase participation of, 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 of businesses of color. That's also with the TGB program, which is the Targeted Group Business Program. There is discussions uh, and implementation around how do we, uh, 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 how do we in real time um, uh, diversify the the uh, the uh, folks who are getting this money, and in in order to do business with state agencies, you have to be certified. And the problem is with these different municipalities is that you have to go to each one in order to be certified. So they're looking at how do you do a universal certification process. So when you do it one place, it goes to all the others, and and you will meet those needs there. Another place is that we're talking about for businesses is also the angel investment tax credit. How do we expand that so that more businesses of color and women-owned businesses and veterans are able to take advantage of it? Because right now, the pot is so small that the money goes away r right away. And then, of course, there's how do you also expand uh, capital access? Because when we, when we think in terms of our businesses, they need access to capital, right, in order to make sure that they can uh, go into business. And, and when there are contracting opportunities, they're talking about breaking up those contracts in order to make it much more competitive for our smaller businesses can really compete and, and, and uh, do a good job there. So those are some of the ways uh, that, that we are looking at increasing minority-owned business participation, DBE and TGB, which is targeted group businesses, capital, um, access to capital, angel investment credits, and opportunity. Because, hey, you can have a business, but if you're not getting the opportunity, then uh, then it's a challenge. And, and where are those opportunities? Not just in state agencies, but even with school districts, mm -hmm. the University of Minnesota, Minsku colleges, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and the list goes on and so, on. So, so two, those two ideas, Senator. It seems to me two things have to happen. One is that, uh, again, addressing the past. The past is when we've attempted to do business mm -hmm. with these institutions and organizations, we've been rebuffed. Mm -hmm. It's been more difficult. It's like when we tried to vote, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have to guess how many jelly beans are in the jar mm -hmm. in order to vote. That's the system of keeping you out of this revenue stream. But say we get past that, how do we keep our people focused on getting to the promised land. The promised land is equal access to a fair playing field and a chance to do business commensurate with our presence in the state. That's number one, that's our side. The other side, though, is how do we uh, change either policy or incentive or uh, punishment for departments of government that continue to block access in a way that uh, is inconsistent with the governor's goal. Before I have you answer that, I want to take a second to do, uh, uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, station ID. Oh, we'll do it right now. Let's take a station ID. Let me tell you that you're listening to a special uh, Insight News KMOJ, uh, Black Music America, BMA Networks Cable TV, Town Hall Forum in St. Paul. Our topic today is the $1.9 billion Minnesota budget surplus, what it means for our community. We'll take a break for a minute and to listen to our sponsors. Two minutes. We'll come back. back to the special town hall meeting in St. Paul. We're at SPNN TV, which you're watching this live on SPNN channel 19 in St. Paul and on MTN channel 16 Minneapolis. You're listening live on KMOJ, the heart and soul of Twin Cities. Uh, the first of its kind, first ever uh, multimedia uh, joint simulcast. And we're here to talk about the serious business of the $1.9 billion budget surplus for the state of Minnesota. The question is, how do we protect, preserve, uh, and attain uh, our interest as African Americans? And I want to bring uh, more conversation 
uh, from our audience, but we left talking about the question of this tension. How do we uh, get businesses in our community uh, organized, uh, committed to going after business opportunity, but also have a state government and a corporate environment that is receptive and responsive to the gifts and the capabilities of our community. Let me turn to uh, Commissioner Myron Franz, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget. What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? What have been the barriers and how do we solve those problems? Well, you know, it's funny because the uh, state of Minnesota is the largest employer. And it's one of the largest contractors in the state. And as Senator Champion mentioned, the governor wants our workforce, he wants the contracting population to look more like the state that we, uh, that we uh, currently have here. And so he has issued an executive order uh, on diversity and inclusion, developing a council. And that council is designed to, do, to have actions, not designed just to meet and talk. It's designed to increase uh, contracting with minority-owned businesses. It's designed as uh, I'm in charge of all the employment for the state of Minnesota, and we're, we are operating to try to reduce those barriers. We just, in fact, hired a new diversity and inclusion um, uh, uh, statewide recruiter, and she starts on Monday. So we're trying to put in action ways. We, one of the things that happens is that, especially at the higher levels of, uh, of state government, we don't reflect the community that we really populate. And we want to try to make sure that we reach out and we expand that. And we also want people to come to join of, of minority backgrounds, but we want them to stay. We want them to have a career in state government. So it's not just attracting, it's retaining and engaging people. And also, so Commissioner Mossman of uh, uh, the administration is working on the contracting. Commissioner Lindsay at the Human Rights Commission is working on making sure that we outreach and have engagement so we know that we're including all the right people and I'm in charge of the employment practices. But all those together are designed to actually increase the underrepresented contracting, increase the underrepresented em, uh, employees in the state of Minnesota so that we have a more you know, reflective uh, state government. Senator Champion. And, and, and to that end, as the governor is working on that side, he's also, and we're also working on the other side, as I mentioned earlier, to streamline the certification process that's important because in order to do business with the state of Minnesota, you have to be certified. Mm -hmm. And also trying to provide technical support so whatever that process is that's universal, uh, 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 minority-owned businesses or women-owned businesses are engaged and a part of that. And all the other stuff that I talked about as far as access to capital. But also, uh, lastly, is tying um, uh, the um, uh, a person's working, like, I guess I'm trying to say, if if on the other end, other end, like a commissioner, if if there are goals, and if if those goals are not being met, how does that uh, how's that being reflected in their evaluation, for an example? So tying it there as well. So it it's it, it's all throughout the process. Let me ask uh, another person from the audience to uh, a leader in community to join this conversation, uh, Abdurazak Bihi is uh, with Somali Education and Social Advocacy. Uh, Abdurazak, Brother Behe, good morning. Well, uh, thank you very much for We've having me. We've close to the microphone there. Yes, We've worked you. a lot trying to create uh, bridges yes. and relationships between the immigrant African community and the African American community. Uh, but there are challenges in that, but particular challenges for immigrant communities. What would you like to see the legislature do to create greater inclusion and greater support for the organizations that serve immigrant communities in general, Somali in particular? Yes, uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank you for having me. And I would like to tell the audience and or everybody who's watching the opportunities that we had for the past seven years by working and engaging our African American community and learning from them. Um, was created by Al Flowers, who really outreached to the Somalia and East African and West African community and brought us together. And there are a lot of great things we have gained. Uh, we were an isolated community that has been discriminated against because we are immigrants, black, and Muslim. And that has created our youth to be pushed around and our youth joined international terrorism um, that the White House just had a conference and, and created international and national problem because we as a state and a county and cities failed 
to engage our communities. So I really thank our flowers. Uh, I'm working with the emerging workforce that uh, brought us to the table, uh, that are investing, intending to invest in our community by creating jobs. We are working with uh, Summit Academy. We have already trained 45 people. Um, some of them are working at the Viking Stadium. Some of them are working across my office in Cedar Riverside. The same young people who used to stand on the, on the street and run into trouble. So those resources and engagements has been fruitful, but the challenges are bigger. We are a community that has been um, um, really um, uh, isolated, and uh, we are over 100,000. And uh, every year I go to 42 uh, neighborhoods, ranging from Cedar Riverside to Mankato to Barron, um, Wisconsin, and to uh, uh, Marshall, Rochester, St. Cloud, and we see the same underlying conditions that perpetuate our community into chronic unemployment. So we turn into creating businesses. Uh, our number one employer is a Somali American small businesses. Really? And they are also being um, challenged now because we are being denied to have a basic contracts, healthcare or other jobs with the state to provide not only for other people, but for our own community. Because we have a language issue now we are talking about Target losing 1,500 jobs. Nobody has spoken about 2,000 jobs we have lost one year, where the unemployment rate is over 50%. Mm -hmm. So our biggest employer is under attack because someone, one person or two persons, had made a mistake, and we have been channelized over 100,000 people. So those are the conditions that create or make our community isolated and alienated. So we will like the state and I know our senators are, are working very hard, educating our businesses. Senator Hayden has done a lot of work to outreach to the Somali businesses, to educate them, and also to advocate for them. But we would like the state to know the White House is involved to create jobs. The uh, international community is involved, and these are Americans right here in the city of Minneapolis and the Twin Cities. We would like the state to get involved so we could have the same opportunities like the Russian community or Bosnian community to provide those culturally and language appropriate Explain services that. to Explain our that. community. So you're saying that other immigrant communities are getting favorite yes. treatment, Russians, yes. Bosnians, yes. and others, but Somalis are not having the same advantage. When we try to provide uh, health care or transportation services to our community because they need our language, someone who speaks their language, our businesses started to employ a lot of people and they have seen a great attack. Let me, let me say this, you know, I've uh, commented on this a lot of times, but this is one more example of this uh, story I'll say, or the saying that I've, uh, I've put out. And too often in our community, uh, we get the misery, they get the money. There's a lot of money associated with solving problems. The solving problems is really a business, and it's a good business to be in. And the question I hear being raised by Brother Abdul Razak B is should not our people be first in line to solve the problem, be in the business of problem solving in our community, and enjoy, engage those revenue streams associated with problem solving. The history is that as often as not, they codify our misery, maintain us in misery, and they use our misery as a feeding trough upon to enrich their suburban uh, and let me be honest, uh, they're, they're white uh, privilege. And so my question, uh, taking off from where you are, is that uh, how do we make sure that, number one, if we got a problem, Senator, we got to have the solution. The solution should be ours. And if there's money associated with solving that problem, that money ought to come through our community to build capacity. Senator Hayden, what do you think? So first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Behe for uh, his words his, and his tireless uh, activism. Uh, in, the, in the African heritage community as a whole, but especially in the East African and Somali community. And he's right, we have been working on these issues. And so um, we have some specifics. One, we are working through this issue that Mr. Behe alluded to around the, the medical transportation. So people that are sick and don't have transportation for them to be able to safely get back and forth to their uh, uh, medical appointments. And so there has been 
a few uh, folks that, for whatever reason, uh, did not follow the rules um, and their contracts were uh, uh, terminated. Um, however, they have been replaced by people outside of the community. Mm -hmm. So it is also this issue of when um, an African-American person or a person of African heritage does something, the whole community has to suffer. Um, and the other flip hand side, if a person in the white or Caucasian, it's just that individual. So the issue that he's talking about to drill down, we are working closely with the Department of Human Service and their vendors uh, to rectify that issue. But I wouldn't have known that if we didn't have people like Mr. Behe and others uh, working with community to raise those issues to the top. I will say a few things is we are working on this youth issue that Mr. Behe talked about and that the president is concerned about. So there are pieces of legislation to fund um, organizations that specifically, one is Kajug, but there are others that specifically are working on this issue of engaging our young people. Youth employment, um, also there is a wonderful pilot program where young East African, mostly Somali kids are working with the University of Minnesota around food. They've created their Urban 4-H program, Urban Agriculture program. There is, an, there is even a Somali Boy Scout troop that we are looking to help fund and that those bills are working uh, through the process. We also have had money that we've appropriated in the healthcare side last year that we're working closely with Somali uh, women and reproductive issues that are prevalent, and I know that uh, uh, Sister Fahia is here and others, and so we are working with people like the People's Clinic, uh, Sarah Noor, you might have seen her uh, lately, a, a fabulous uh, um, public uh, health executive. So we're working with now with the departments to ensure, as Senator Champion talked about, that we are targeting these resources in the community with professionals that know how to work with them so that it is a broader issue. And I, I think, Al, you're alluding to that we uh, respect a lot of our nonprofit organizations and the work that they do, but often they attack this from a missionary standpoint, mm -hmm. that they're kind of helping these poor people. Well, we know that we don't look at ourselves as people that need to have to, that, that we need to be, we, we need to be dealt with that way. We need to be invested in, right, is the same that we do everybody else. We need to have a, a step up and a hand up, but not necessarily a hand out. So the organizations that we're talking about and that we're now targeting with pieces of legislation that are currently running through the legislature specifically is going to those organizations. We are also working with an outreach plan. Um, uh, our commissioners are talking about having a workforce even the investigators and the folks that are teaching or that are talking about how this works, they need to reflect the community that they're working in. Often what happens is people don't know the rules. They don't know how this works. We can't communicate to that. We can't communicate to them effectively. And then when they kind of go a little far of the rules, then we take it all down. So we have to also invest in our state government in terms of the people who work in state government. So the actual workers, the, the, the investigators and others to make sure that when we're sitting down to have this conversation, that it is clear as to what the rules are so that they can do a good job. Let me introduce uh, Chanel Walton. She is the CEO and director of a group called Dynamic Youth Connections. Chanel, thank you for being here. Thank you for leadership. And uh, talk about what Dynamic, Dynamic Youth Connections is and uh, weigh in. Are young people's voices being heard? And if not, what can we do to engage that population? So um, thank you for having me. And Dynamic Youth Connections is a nonprofit organization. Um, we raise scholarship funds for high school students to continue their education at college. Um, and the issue is that um, last year I had an event where I had a $500 scholarship opportunity to give away and nobody showed up. Hmm. Um, when I tried to reach out to different schools, um, I asked if we can have like some type of investment opportunity and it was kind of shot down because um, they said that our students don't work, um, which kind of shocked me because I was, I was like, when and where did we become lazy and work? Um, where is the commitment? Um, and I'm also you know, working with students now and a dance um, opportunity that I do, and there's no commitment there. So it's just a matter of, as we are all talking about right now, is just investing and trying to push them to stick to working out, you know, being committed to one thing. And also with the scholarship, um, it's just trying to find the students. You know, they're, the people are 
in the school saying, hey, we need you to go to this website to, for this scholarship opportunity. But when it's, when it's being present, it's kind of hard to get students there. So um, two challenges. One is, uh, number one, making students aware of the yes. opportunity and uh, inviting them and encouraging them to step up yes. and embrace the opportunity. But there's also some resistance from the institutions, right? Yes. They don't provide the support you need to bring the value which is financial, mm -hmm. that you want to bring to our families. Representative Moran, this is not a new story, I'm sure. Uh, people in your district and in the community uh, have great ideas and, and want to be of service, but sometimes uh, don't have the feedback from the school district, the school board, uh, the city council, uh, other bodies that are charged with handling that activity. How do we both uh, grow that interest and nurture it and make it effective in having ownership of solving problems by our community? Well, I started off, uh, Al, by stating that we are, are back in our community doing great things. Um, we have solutions. We are creating outcomes. And I would say in many ways we are a part of reducing the disparities, our impact in our state, mm -hmm. but not always recognized for that work in a way that other entities are. But um, I, I think, you know, when we looked at um, the Somali, our Somali speaker here, talk about the, the lack of support uh, that the community is getting, you know, and what we can do about that. And a part of that solution is, is exactly what they did. They brought a bill to the House, right? They brought a bill to the House, and I guess to the Senate also, where we're going to look at how do we in invest in opportunities that get our kids off the streets, get the Somali kids off the street and really revert them from even thinking about, you know, going over and, and fighting for ISIS. And part of that is to creating the opportunities for job training, the, the mentorship, the, you know, the paid in, uh, internship in the 4-H. But we need the, the institutions. We need the institution to value what we bring to the table. Um, and within that, you know, because we are so often left off the process, sometimes we don't know exactly what that process is. Mm -hmm. And so we need that commitment from state entities, whether that is the city, the county, or the state. We need them to have that investment in our strengths and what we bring to the table and to be creative and, innov and, and innovative. You know, because, you know, we can say that, um, you know, Minnesota is a great state. But we can also say, and I guess no one said it better than the Department of Health, who said that disparities exist because of structural racism. And that is the policies or practice that takes place within these, these entities. I am a strong believer, and I know there's many people who believe that those who are impacted by a system are those who can bring solutions to how that system can best work for them. And so we need to create the opportunities and the space and be innovative and be, and, and and to be innovative uh, and allow creativity to come into play that comes from community of color to bring the solution that they are doing that they know can best serve the communities in which they are a part of. So I, 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 I just, um, to my good commissioner here, I'm so glad you're here, you know? Because <laughs> this is really, really important that we are open enough to see the innovations that come from these communities and find a way to align practices, implementation to those visions that comes from our community. Let me raise one more piece here, and I mentioned it earlier uh, about young people. I, I see, and maybe I'm looking at this wrong, but a connection between this challenge of uh, the lure uh, of engagement for Somali youth. I see that as the same as the lure for African American youth to uh, so-called gang activity. Uh, the bottom line, the connector from my point of view, is young people who want to be valued, who want to be loved, who believe they are important, they believe their m lives matter, but they are faced with uh, elders and a community that doesn't recognize their worth, their value, and their vision of who they are and who they will become. And so, should we be looking at legislation that also talks about uh, supporting the White House in creating options for Somali uh, or Muslim youth to keep them away from the, the lure and the, um, the fantasy of jihad, right, of terror, uh, and also looking at 
ways to engage young African Americans who think thug life. Absolutely. Street life. Yeah. I mean, is, is it the same thing or not? Maybe I it's think not that's the part same. of the, the whole President and Brothers, and you're, my brother's, is it my, you're my brother's keeper, mm -hmm. you know, those initiatives. I just want to share a quick story um, that's come from St. Paul uh, that happened a few years ago when uh, within the St. Paul communities, one summer there was like shooting, there was fighting, there was just gang activity going on. And, you know, sometimes we dread the next summer coming because we know what's going to happen, right? And so it was one of those moments, and I was like, oh, gosh, it's getting warm. What's going to happen? And the summer came, and we're into the summer, and it's quiet. It's quiet in the neighborhood. And I go and I ask um, our former um, police chief, John Harrington, about, you know, what's going on? Why, you know, why is it I don't, you know, there's any, there isn't any shooting or fighting? And what he said to me was this. He said, we pretty much know who the guys are who's out there causing the disruption. And we, we round them up and we gave them some options. And we said to them, you're going to either find yourself incarcerated, you'll find yourself dead. And those are the two choices that if you keep down this path, what's going to happen. And what he said we did, we offered them a job. Some of the jobs was just simply at McDonald's or other minimum wage jobs. But the fact is, you know, believe it or not, our young people want to be valued. Mm -hmm. They want to have something to do and a place to go to take care of themselves because a lot of times they're homeless. They're, they're out there on their own. And, I mean, just a simple job kept our community safe. I kept our community quiet. And it helped our state with a tax base, right? And so... So often, we really have to work really hard to connecting the values of what we bring in, and sometimes that is nothing more than just a simple job and the opportunity to be valued and to take care of yourself and sometimes your family. Senator Champion, what do you think? And, and to that end, uh, in the legislature, you, you jam a place, you jam a place, uh, they have a, a, a piece of legislation that's coming forward that's going through the process. Uh, Stair Steps, the Believe Bowl, that's an educational initiative in order to encourage our young people to um, learn and to be educated. Uh, Minneapolis has the Step Up Achieve program, which is the youth summer program, because we have to continue to, to engage our youth to create opportunities for them. And so these are some of the uh, things that I know of just off the top of my head that are going through the process uh, so that we can uh, uh, really combat poverty and create opportunities so that uh, they are prepared academically so that they know about the scholarship programs and opportunities for college. So I just wanted to throw that in as, as far as what's going on. I'm Al McFarland. You're watching uh, a special town hall meeting. We're at St. Paul Neighborhood Network in St. Paul. This is being broadcast uh, live on SPNN TV, Channel 19 in St. Paul, Channel 16 on MTN in Minneapolis, and live on KMOJ FM 89.9, the heart and soul of Twin Cities. The town hall is on Minnesota's budget surplus. The question is, how do we protect, uh, identify, and achieve our interest as the black community. One of the things the governor talks about is transportation. Uh, in a memo a couple of days ago, he uh, noted that his budget is asking to drive transportation forward. And starting Monday, he's going to be making stops in Moorhead, Bemidji, uh, presenting a proposal that will fund over 600 projects, uh, totaling more than 2,200 miles of roadways and 300 bridges across Minnesota. But the governor's office says, unfortunately, the plan proposed by the House Republicans doesn't measure up. They want to fix only 40 miles of pavement, pavement over the next four years. Transportation is big. Transportation is big, big money. I've asked uh, Ron Harris, who's with the Neighborhood Organizing for Change Project, and they're advocating engagement around transit equity to talk a minute about transportation, what it means for our community, and how big a deal it is. Why should we be at the table? Ron, thank you for being here. Hey, thanks a lot for inviting me. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to say a couple words about this. Please. Again, I work at NOC, Neighborhoods Organizing for Change, and one of the pillars of the organization is the transit equity piece. And transit equity is so important because we're talking about raising working conditions for people and all these other things. But without transportation, a lot of folks can't even get to work. And we recognize that, you know, with all the gaps that we have, transportation are one of those things that could close those gaps based on or just with the ability for people to get around the way that they want to get around. 
Uh, NOC is generally supportive of the governor's plan um, in the budget in terms of transportation. We recognize the need for greater Minnesota to have their roads and their bridges funded and all those things. But I guess where, where we're coming from is we want to know what specific action steps or strategies can we take to be at the table so the governor hears that transit equity is a very important thing. We have some a lot of low-income folks that we serve that are part of our base, and they're not getting the transportation options that they deserve in a 21st century economy. We can't even compete without that. Senator Champion, you just had a hearing on transportation two days ago, I think, this week. Absolutely. Give uh, us the report. What, uh, where where well, are we? Well, let me give you the report. So <laughs> part of what we did is uh, uh, the Minnesota Senate uh, Transportation Committee is headed by Senator Scott Dibble. Um, and the vice chair is Susan Kent. Uh, I am on the transportation committee. We came to, uh, uh, we've been going around the state in order to talk about transportation needs and the importance of it and what sort of transportation package should uh, be advanced in order to make sure that we can pay for the roads and bridges and transit needs of our entire community. We know that if we don't have a des dedicated funding source that uh, we will continue to lag behind when we think in terms of paying for our infrastructure. Uh, and so when you think about our infrastructure, uh, if we were just to um, maintain or try to maintain the current infrastructure that we have right now, we'd be paying over $300 million annually, right? And so, but, but there's not enough revenue in order to do that, right? And so the governor's package, um, uh, includes uh, 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 you, uh, potentially what Scott Dibbles with the sentence package includes um, a a uh, tax on the wholesale portion of things uh, that that we believe that there's a dedicated revenue that dedicated revenue will pay for road bridges transit bikeways and also we talk about equity so Move Minnesota is a is a coalition that's been going around the state as well talking about uh, equity right. Equity for us is not just building the transit way, but also creating uh, a gateway to where the jobs are, right? Uh, um, we've been talking a lot about Southwest, for an example, Botno, uh, getting to the those outer ring suburbs and getting to those jobs. And, and, and so we can uh, put a dent in uh, uh, underemployed, right? Not just unemployed, but underemployed, uh, getting to those outside developments, Right, transit-oriented de development, that is an important notion and lens that we should look at when we think in terms of transportation, uh, bike, biking, because that's a number, a, another form of transportation that we don't talk a lot about. We, as, as, a, as a community, look at biking from a recreational perspective, but we also believe that you should be looking at it from a transportation-oriented perspective. So that total package, looking at it so that we have uh, infrastructure development, but also getting to and from jobs and also building out the line itself uh, so that you have people of color. Now, lastly, we spend roughly a billion dollars a year through the uh, through uh, MnDOT. Mm -hmm. We we talk about the, the Viking Stadium being a big thing, but we spend about a billion dollars a year there. So there is an opportunity there. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. That does. Let's take a moderator. break for station ID again. You're listening to, you're watching the special Insight KMOJ BMA Network's cable television town hall on Minnesota's $1.9 billion budget surplus. What does it mean for our community? We'll be back in two minutes. McFarland, welcome back to the special town hall meeting. Uh, the subject is the $1.9 billion Minnesota state budget, what it means to our community. We've got great voices here raising questions to our esteemed panel. Our panelists include uh, Senator Jeff Hayden, Senator Bobby Champion, State Representative Rena Moran, and Com the Commissioner of the Management and Budget Department of the State of Minnesota, Commissioner um, uh, Myron, Myron. <laughs> senior moment, Myr Myr Myron France, thank you, Myron. So I want to go to uh, Lisa Clemens. Lisa, you've got an organization called uh, Mother's Love Initiative. Uh, 
talking about African mother, American mothers, what's the priority for you? My priority has already been mentioned here in a lot of what you've said. When you talk about the child protection issue, I used to be a sergeant in the police department, so I authorized the removal of many kids from homes, but I never saw the end result. Now, as a foster care mother, I get to be part of that end result. Mm -hmm. We were missing from the table with the governor. Black foster care parents were missing from the table, and a lot of those are, are women. In the child protection, in the child care issue, you fund uh, K through third, you fund early childhood, but those kids still have to come home to us. So if the homes are not fixed, the kids won't get fixed. So we're missing from that. The issues we face as black women, black mothers, black sisters and black, aunt, black aunts are more complex than others. Our children come from predominantly 70% African American single mother homes. We are unemployed, we have a higher rate of poverty, we suffer homicide of our children at an alarming rate. Our daughters are fighting in the schools on city transportation, and our daughters are being trafficked into sex trafficking. But what's missing from all of that is African American mothers and women. We are not at the table. This uh, a Mother's Love Initiative was created to bring us back in the forefront of issues that are involving our children, our sons and our daughters. We do have uh, My Brother's Keeper and a whole lot of other things that's geared toward our African-American men, but that's gonna be an imbalance. Because when you're done fixing our African-American men and fathers, you have forgotten about us. So in order for us to meet them 50-50, we need to be fixed and made whole too. So you save the children, you save the parents, the mothers, you save our children. Great comments, thank you so much. Uh, Representative uh, Moran, what about it? Well, she just said it all, you know, but what I got out of that most important is you talked about the disparities, you talk about trauma, you talk about toxic stress, and those things that impacts our lives that really starts the brain development. That's right. You know, and so until we get into those factors, that sometime in our community, we are living in war-torn zones like we're over in Iraq, right? Sure. And so there are things that we need to do right here to maintain and make sure that our children and our families are getting the resources uh, and the support and the tools to be successful in their family. And when we touch mothers, when we fix mothers and families, you know, and not just focus on the child because the child's are connected to others. And we know the impact that has when a child has to be removed from the household and from the community and everything that knows and the trauma that places on that child. Even when that child tries to go into a school setting and he cannot sit still, he's causing chaos because of the, dis the disconnection he is having. Absolutely. And so... And so you're absolutely, I mean, Lisa was absolutely right. It is about the mothers. It is about the family. It is about the whole family. Unit. Senator, so specifically, I think that the work that we're doing on the Child Protection Task Force um, and, and having a thorough look at how do we deal with this issue with the families, with the foster care system, with the attorneys, uh, with, with the public defenders and others, that's the work that the Senator Champion has actually been just a a real strong voice on that as well as Representative Moran and I. The, another thing specifically is we are working, and I'm the chief author of the bill, that in the Minnesota Families Investment Program, that's our public assistance program, there has not been an, an increase in the dollars that families get since 1986. So we do have a bill today that will add $100 per month more. That may not sound a lot, but $100 to a low-income family is a lot. And the last thing that I will say specifically around uh, early childhood is most of our folks, as they start to get off of public assistance, use a program called CCAP, which is what allows low-income uh, and moderately-income folks uh, go to work and have their child in a early childhood education program that the state subsidized. We are, there's a waiting list on that, so I have a bill that will eliminate the waiting list and it will give the actual providers of the service more money to take care of our children. I just want to make sure that we, there's some specific things that people know and can look out for um, and help us advocate for as we go through this process. Lastly, just on that point, because you guys have us talking about major issues that you can't just, you know, breeze by, but specifically to uh, uh, a mother's love, uh, there is a proposal where some folks who've been walking through the child protection issue around navigators and, and, and culturally competent na navigators, which could, could tie into what 
the uh, Miss Clemens was talking about. So that is an issue, and making sure that there's resources for that sort of connection uh, with families that are going through uh, child protection. Last but certainly not least, she's right about the profile of the person who usually is going through ch child protection, which is uh, a, a single mother, multiple children, and, and uh, someone who can't, could be employed or underemployed. But we know that there's that gender disparity around pay. So those women are always receiving less for the same work that a man does. Right. So, so, so we are looking to create uh, gender uh, parity, and so there's a bill that's going through the legislature around this. So Valerie Robinson has a question about criminal justice system. Valerie, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, and thank you for having this forum uh, today. It's been very enlightening for me. Uh, my question um, with regard to the surplus um, has to do with uh, legal and criminal justice, and it to me, criminal justice and the legal system has a lot of tentacles that ends up being in a circle, meaning that you are, African Americans are stopped, convicted, and imprisoned more than anyone um, else in the state. And I think that with regard to that, it would be helpful if some of that funding could be put forward to um, training and um, enlightening everyone in the justice system from judges to county and city attorneys to uh, victim advocates to lawyers and everything that has to do with feeding African Americans into the prism or incarceration system. Because once they're in there, I think it solves a lot of problems if that could get repair. They go into the system um, it's difficult to get out and get a job because of the criminal history, and I was a senior HR generalist for 23 years, and that's what prompts me to ask this question. Uh, it's difficult to get a job. It's difficult to get housing. You've already paid your debt to society. It's difficult to get back to your family, and, 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 and it, then it pushes you back into the system Valerie, again. thank you for the question. Commissioner uh, Myron France, so you've heard this uh, question about how lots of budgets, but circular exclusion of our community on the solution side of the equation. How do we deal with that? How does it sound to you? Well, it, you know, one of the things I think that Governor Dayton is really concerned about is where do we put our priorities? We've been talking about the math a little bit, but you've all mentioned, all my colleagues up here have mentioned the, the values in the budget too. So the, the budget is part math, math has got to work, but it's also values. And one of the things that I, I think you'll see this next week, when the governor comes out with his new budget, you're going to see a very strong endorsement of the, of the task force on the protective services, for example. The governor is going to very, be very supportive of the recommendations coming out of there for child protection. The other thing that he, that he really wants to support is make sure we, that we fund are these opportunities for people to be, you know, get a job, get, get employed, and, and get trained for that next job, too. Our demographics are such that our job pool is, is shrinking but it's also becoming more diverse. Mm -hmm. So we have to, we have, it's not only good makes, it's not only fair and what's right, we actually have to reach into our communities and we need every kid to succeed. We need every person to succeed because we need them in our workforce, we need them to take that next job and it reduces all these problems. We know that if we put money on the front end of helping people, it's a lot less expensive than at the tail end. Carolyn Brown, you had a question or comment? Community Stabilization Project, and we are housing advocates, and we've been in round since 1989. And our thing is that we're trying to right now we introduce a bill to change the language around eviction orders, because eviction orders right now stand on records for seven years, causing a lot of these families to be displaced out of homes that's affordable that they once could afford. So now we're asking that that language be changed to reduce that from seven years to three years, as well as ask that if they have won a case that the our eviction will automatically be removed. Senator, uh, and that ties into <coughs> the expungement uh, uh, work you've been doing as well. Absolutely, and it ties into something that I did uh, last year. Uh, as you know, I was the chief author of the major expungement bill, and a part of that was housing uh, and making it much more feasible if someone goes to court and they win their uh, their case that, uh, that they can move immediately for uh, their record to be expunged, right? right on the spot. And so that's in law right now. 
Um, and there's some other tweaking that we will do on the housing side of the equation. Um, the other person who came up and talked about correctional reform, that's something that we are looking to do. Sentencing reform, that's something that's there. Uh, taking certain offenses off the books. So there's a lot of reforms that are happening right now and continues to happen. And because of time, I'll leave it there. And if someone uh, wants to contact me, that they can. Let's bring another voice in. Steve Cobb uh, works with uh, Youth Development, Youth Employment. Steve, thank you for being here. Thank you. And I'd like to uh, say thank you to everyone for this forum, including St. Paul Neighborhood Network and all the media entities involved. Um, just to get right down to uh, cases. I wanted to talk about youth development and just to talk about to what would be the grade if we were to give an A, B, or C, or D, or F to um, <clears throat> our state's leaders, our community's leaders, um, in terms of youth development. Um, that's would it be an A? Would it be a C? That's a great, let's leave it there. Let's go down the panel. Thank you for the question. Well, I'd like to say um, that <laughs> employment, uh, when we walk in, when we're in our community in St. Paul, we feel like sometimes we're alienated, that we're, we're not somehow employed, involved, and engaged in when it comes down to uh, youth employment and youth development. Um, Senator, I'll leave it right there. Senator Champion, let's go down the line. How do you grade uh, our community? How do you grade the legislature, the cities, and the counties when it comes to uh, service to young people, uh, particularly youth employment? Senator Champion? Well, I think that um, in our communities, we are doing a good job of identifying and coming up with these youth development initiatives. In Minneapolis, for an example, Sweetie Pie, that is uh, th that is an urban agricultural initiative with Michael Cheney and those guys. In St. Paul, you have Ujama Place, but we need to do a better job on the state level of investing targeted dollars to these sort of organizations that are now getting money other places, but not si not necessarily getting money from the state. And so there's also M Minneapolis Step Up Program. So there are youth development initiatives, but youth employment initiatives, but development's a different question because that gets to our community-based organizations. And I believe that in the latter part of the 70s, uh, there was a change, and therefore we, uh, the philanthropic community was not and has not been investing into to those youth development initiatives. And so therefore, that's a different question. So I, I think that we can do better. Senator Champion. Senator Hayden. You know, I think Senator Champion and I, as you know, work closely together, so we kind of feel the same way. You know, one of the things that we talk about um, and the focus has been on education in the classroom, education and all of the uh, metrics and measurements there. But there is a social determinant to education, which is how are the families doing? How are the young people doing when they leave school and when they go to bed and when they wake up and what's happening with them over the summer? And so we have to be able to really kind of focus our efforts also in that. I think that the philanthropic community uh, has uh, taken, uh, needs to take another look at how they're working with youth development. I frankly think the state has to take another look at how they work at youth development, recognizing that education is the key. It's the anchor, but there are other things that affect children and their families that help us get moved uh, the, the, the education ladder. So I think that we have to, if I would say we get a C, um, especially in our community, and maybe a D plus. So we do have to focus a lot more on this issue of children and their families holistically. Commissioner Franz, how do you grade uh, Minnesota and our communities uh, in response uh, to uh, you know, youth and youth development? Well, I know we can do a lot better. And I think one of the things that we find at the state level, it's, it's the development of these local programs that are the best. I mean, sometimes the best way to develop something is, is not to tr start at the top and work it down, but to let the community come up with ideas and programs that work, and then take those programs and reinforce them and make sure that they, that they work. So I know that's one of the things we try to do is look for, uh, I know Kevin Lindsay, the Commissioner of Human Rights, looks a lot toward the community to find out where are those programs that we can steal, if you will, steal their ideas and get them to working for us, because at the state level, we can do much better in terms of young young people. Representative Moran, uh, briefly. So I want to say real quickly that there's, uh, in St. Paul, the YWCA, who is, um, has a bill that is going around the legislature to expand the existing GED support service opportunity. We must get our kids educated so they can go on to become productive citizens along with uh, NETCAT, which is the Network for uh, Development for Children of African Descent, 
who would like some funds uh, used for family literacy services. They are doing an excellent job currently with the county to really engage black communities on, around literacy. It's a whole family dynamic there, doing an awesome job. And just want to say that um, I have a working up bill that really is about, we talk about the criminal justice system, which is around a racial impact screening that needs to be done. So it's a screening that must be uh, conducted by the Sentencing Guideline Commission on all legislation which may, if enacted, uh, affect the racial composition of the criminal justice system. Because we know it is the black and brown faces mm -hmm. that is in those systems in great numbers. Okay. So before any legislation continues to um, grow the disparities within our system, they must go through a screening. And last, I just want to talk about housing, and we know within the housing entity, UDs is the only place where a person is found guilty before they go to court. Yeah. And so we got to do better in creating opportunities where people can <laughs> afford housing, get housing, and be sustained, because we know that is a big part of creating better educational outcomes when families are stable. Thank you. Farhia Khalif is the political action chair for the St. Paul NAACP. Uh, thank you for being here. And Farhia, what are the pressing issues for you, for the NAACP and for the community that we think, you think we should be tackling uh, as we consider the budget surplus? Oh, thank you for having us and uh, St. Paul NAACP. I believe this um, important issues that we have in here today, and I'm glad to see a lot of you are stepping up and to speak about it, especially our great senators here, Bobby Joe and Senator Jeff Hayden and Sister Rina Moran and Commissioner. Um, but I believe 1.9 billion surplus in the state of Minnesota, that will mean nothing for the African American community. We're not going to see it, and there's a lot of uh, issues that we care about that is not addressed when it comes to the uh, empl unemployment. Our youth, our sister here, and Lisa, when she spoke the mother love, I'm the executive director of an organization called Voice of East African Woman. I sit with the mothers daily, once a month. You know the issues, they care about it. The youth are easily traveling to overseas to be joined in ISIS and other terrorist organizations. Our own president, and, and Barack Hussein Obama, he took the time to listen to our need, and he did fund the Somali community. But what about the state of Minnesota? What are you guys are doing about it? There's some the brothers in... Um, right now called Kajok are fighting for this extremist and many other organizations. But the problem is Minnesota transportation, where they are employing over so far over 4,000 people, but it's only less than 300 African-American and minority people are being employed. But there's a lot of uh, work to, ahead of the struggle. It's not over yet. But I believe we are going to be fighting for this. We want to work with you guys, but at the end of the day, there's no jobs for when it comes to the black and, and African-American community. There's no, yeah, I can't go on, but today is not enough time for us to talk <laughs> of this. I believe you guys have us again back in this table and to talk about the issues that we care about. It. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to remind our listeners that uh, this program will be heard on its entirety again tomorrow between uh, 4 and 6 on KMOJ. So tune in to KMOJ. FM 89.9 tomorrow, Sunday, 4 to 6 for the entire broadcast again. And BMA Cable TV Network will be airing a special uh, review of this show uh, on Comcast Channel 937 and on demand throughout the month of March. I'm going to ask uh, Scott Gray, who is the CEO and chair of the Minneapolis Urban League, welcome, Scott, to do a summation, a wrap-up. You've uh, been listening. You've heard all of the legislators speak. You've heard the community. And you're active in the field as a leader of one of the legacy organizations. What are you hearing today? And how do you summarize uh, the call to action this forum represents today? Sure. Thank you for having me. And um, thanks uh, to the distinguished panel here today, our, our great senators and our house rep uh, and our commissioner. Um, I, I want to just say that um, I was in Selma uh, last week and, um, and the uh, conversation around kind of what we need to do to move forward is I think a s similar conversation that is happening here at this table today and needs to be um, really accelerated in this community if we don't want to continue to go uh, if we want to go forward instead of going backward. Um, I look at um, a number of things that it relates to jobs and education and opportunity. And when you, when you hear a lot of folks talking about equity these days, but 
the institutions like the Urban League, the NAACP, um, the black church, um, our um, historic black universities have always toted that line. And it, it's been about trying to make sure that our people have a place and that our people are going to move to be uh, in a place to be successful. And so I think that we just have to make this very much intentional um, in our work. And I think an organization that I work for, the Urban League, is, is working around jobs and education. Uh, we're pushing a bill called the 13th grade. We're in a, um, a coalition called the Emerging Workforce. And so we'll keep continuing to push those things, but we need the state, um, this whole entire community, to make sure that we're at the capacity level that we need. If you put all of our uh, community organizations of color together, they are not larger than probably a couple of the two biggest um, uh, maybe white organizations in this town. Mm -hmm. And something um, is wrong with that picture. If we've been able to do this and carry the torch for so long, and we've walked through Bloody Sunday, and we've marched, and we've done all these things, somehow it is time for the institutions to get the kind of resources that we need to get to the scale of capacity to get our people to where they need to be in this town. Scott Gray, thank you so much. Well, we're down to the last few minutes, actually two minutes. I'm going to ask our panelists to give a parting word. I call it uh, marching orders. And I'm going to start with the uh, senior member of the Senate, uh, Senator Jeff Hayden, and then Senator Champion. Uh, if you would, uh, the 32nd, the elevator speech, uh, Senator Hayden, uh, what we need to do to make sure that our interests are maintained, uh, protected, projected, achieved. Yeah, I just would say we got to get involved, get involved, get involved. If it is an issue that you have, if it is, if you're interested in how our process works, if you're interested in finding out who your legislator is, but at the end of the day, the people who show up are the ones that are being heard. That's why you're going to be heard today. So my message to everybody and all of the various media sites, it is now time to stop complaining. It is now time to come up with solutions and it is now time for you to get involved and get active. Senator Champion. You know, um, I would say that uh, uh, you've heard just the myriad of issues that we have to be concerned about. It's not one. I remember a person saying, what are your major priorities? Well, I don't have the luxury of coming up with a major priority because so many are important to my community. And so, but solutions are necessary and that, uh, we need your support as we keep pounding the pavement and keep uh, navigating through the legislative terrain. And what we have to say is sometimes not popular. And, and, and that's why it becomes equally important for, for us to be connected to uh, uh, um, the grassroots sections of our communities, those people who are in uh, the higher uh, echelons of uh, society to be connected to us because it does take us to work as a team in order to make these things happen. So we need a commitment. We need you and we need you to walk with us. We need you to be engaged in those various areas, talking to us because I am not a person who's in health care. That's why I got my good friend uh, Hayden, but there are other people from North Point, from, uh, from the uh, South South Medical, from uh, here in St. Paul, model cities. Uh, Education, we have Scott Gray and the Urban League, and we have Summit OIC and, and Tyrone Terrell over here in St. Paul, and others, right? I'm only naming people uh, in business when we think in terms of Silas and Keelan Curtis, and when we think in terms of Richard Copeland or NEMC. The whole idea is that in your respective area, it's important for you to help us help you. Thank you. Representative Moran. So, uh, I mean, my colleagues have said it all, but I just would like to, I'm gonna call on the states because I know this Black Caucus worked real hard to, to create better outcomes for the black community and black families and black children. We work hard, but we cannot do this alone. So I am calling on the state to allow the organizations and the businesses that are working so hard back in these communities to transform families' lives so that they can be sustained and self-sufficient to look at the innovations, to look at the creativities, to look at the work that we are doing to create better outcomes and value those outcomes and begin to fund them. We can't do it on a little here and a little there. 
all the research and the data said it takes at least three years for an organization to produce some great outcomes. Invest on us, invest on it in, in, in the outcomes, invest in creating a different outcome so that we can brag about that the disparities in this state has been closed. My, my, the time goes so fast and we're out of time. This has been a wonderful and robust conversation. I want to thank all of our partners, uh, KMOJ, BMA Network, Cable Television, Insight News, uh, SPNN, MTN in uh, Minneapolis. Thanks to our panelists, uh, the Commissioner Myron Franz, Commissioner of the Department of Management and Budget, to Senator Jeff Hayden, Senator Bobby Champion, to uh, State Representative Rena Moran, and to all of our audience here. Uh, this is a robust conversation. It's one we have to keep going, keep doing. Uh, we stay focused on building our community and making sure we have a place at the table of decision. Thanks especially to Carmen Robles and to uh, Elaine Island who helped organize getting people to this program today. And thanks especially to Al Flowers. Al Flowers, tireless, persistent, uh, steadfast in bringing issues to our community. Thank you all for being here.